The United States was once the Philippines' most important partner. This is true for both countries' military alliances, economic interests, and international trade. The Philippines had been cherished by the U.S. They provided military equipment and even established military bases across the Archipelago country. This safeguarded the Philippines both from foreign and local threats. In economic interests, the U.S. was always the one who helped push the country's economy forward. They used their companies from Ford to Intel to set up bases in the Philippines. This helped the country industrialize. It is now one of the world's best sites to open a semiconductor plant for assembly and packaging due to the early entrance of Intel. Further, some of the largest U.S. companies are still pioneers and large investors in the Philippines. While this is not seen in the country's manufacturing sector, it is widely seen in the business processing outsourcing industry (BPO). Now, in terms of international trade, the U.S. has always favored the Philippines. From the early to mid and late 20th century, the U.S. had purchased goods and services from the Philippines. This has resulted in billions of dollars of foreign trade between the two, and at times favor the Philippines. There's only one problem with this magnificent news. It's the fact that they are now in the past. The U.S. is no longer the largest investor in the Philippines, neither are they the largest trading partner. Between 2016 and 2022, the Philippines received significant foreign investments according to data from the central bank. Firms from China and Hong Kong contributed $1.7 billion, making them the second largest investor after Japan, which led with $2.8 billion. They outpaced investments from the USA, $1.3 billion, South Korea, $1.1 billion, and Taiwan, $580 million. In terms of trade, while the United States is still the largest source of exports from the Philippines, they are no longer the largest in terms of both exports and imports. The largest trading partner is now China. The only place where the U.S. was of vital importance to the Philippines is its military, yet it faced severe resistance ever since the late 20th century. During the Ferdinand Marcos senior tenure, the economy of the Philippines was heavily supported by the presence of the American military bases at Subic Bay and Clark Air Base. Additionally, the U.S. has also supported the Philippines through international banking institutions like the World Bank, which played a significant role in planning and managing the Philippine economy under martial law. In early 1991, the Philippine government was in ongoing negotiations with the United States regarding the future status of the U.S. naval and air facilities at Subic Bay and Clark Air Base. What would typically be a matter of foreign policy and national security had become a major domestic political issue with significant economic implications. Domestically, the debate centered on those who viewed the continued presence of U.S. bases as an infringement on Philippine sovereignty and a perpetuation on neo-colonial relationship versus those who saw the bases as essential for internal security, foreign relations, and economic stability. President Aquino, through 1990, refrained from publicly committing to a position, but it was clear her administration sought to reach an accommodation with the United States. As negotiations progressed, the economic dimension gained prominence. From the Philippine government's perspective, there were three key economic considerations. First, the proportion of the national budget allocated to the armed forces was the smallest in the region, a situation linked to the presence of U.S. air and naval forces and direct military assistance. Second, during the latter half of the 1980s, the bases directly employed between 42,000 and 68,000 Filipinos and contracted goods and services from local businesses. Annually, base purchases of goods and services in the Philippine economy adjusted for the estimated import content range between 6 billion and 8.3 billion pesos. A third and politically significant consideration was the financial compensation provided by the United States in connection with the bases, referred to as aid by U.S. officials and rent by Filipinos. Base-related payments were first agreed upon in 1979 when President Jimmy Carter pledged to secure $500 million for the Philippines from Congress over five years. In 1983, another five-year commitment of $900 million was made. In October of 1988, Philippine Secretary of Foreign Affairs Raul Manglapas and U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz signed a two-year agreement for $962 million, double the previous compensation but significantly less than the $2.4 billion initially demanded by the Philippines. By 1991, negotiations over the future of the bases and the terms and size of the compensation for continued U.S. access to military facilities remained the most critical unresolved issue. The inclusion of Secretary of Finance Jesus Estanisleo in the negotiations of March 1991 further highlighted the economic importance of the bases to the Philippine government. Whilst the U.S. is today playing a similar role to what it is back then, it is not that big anymore. The military is not what it once was. So what happened? Is it because the United States is now falling as the world's superpower? Are they now being replaced by China, a country which has become the most important partner in all of Asia? Or is it because the U.S. no longer sees the Philippines as an economic interest, but rather as a mere military interest to them? 
Well, we may first consider China for this reason. This was especially seen through former president Gloria Arayo. Arayo was one of the early presidents who saw a special connection with China. In the early 2000s, President Arayo sought peaceful relations with China in the South China Sea, facilitating significant investment deals and construction contracts with the Philippines. Over time, these Chinese projects became deeply integrated into the local social fabric, positioning Chinese investments as focal points in domestic political conflicts. During the Arayo administration, multiple large-scale Chinese investments were initiated, with around 20 major projects for Chinese firms. Although most faced intense political opposition and rent-seeking allegations, leading to their cancellation by the end of Arreo's term, ZTE's bid for the Philippine National Broadcasting Corporation and CNMEG's high-speed rail project were among those cancelled. But there were successful investments. The State Grid Corporation of China SGCC, successfully privatized the National Transmission Corporation NTZ, and built the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines NGCP, despite initial opposition from political elites and social movements. Following Arayo, the presidency of Rodrigo Duterte had seen a boom in Chinese investments and trade. When resident Rodrigo Duterte visited China in October of 2016, he secured an agreement for $24 billion in Chinese investments and aid for the Philippines. However, many deals were later cancelled or modified, prompting the Philippine government to focus on three key projects while allowing private actors to negotiate independently. The only few projects that actually came alive were the likes of Jack Ma's Ant Financial purchasing a substantially minority stake in Global Telecom's Mint, the opening of 50 smaller offshore gambling companies in the Philippines, Philippine Phoenix Petroleum's agreement with China National Offshore Oil Corporation CNOOC, to build a liquefied natural gas container and Dito Telecom's partnership with China Telecom. The two companies alone are already impacting millions of people in the entire country. The partnership between Jack Ma's Ant Financial and Globe Telecom's Mint is huge. Mint is the one behind the country's Gcash. Gcash is the face of the Philippines' fine tech industry. Ditto Telecom, on the other hand, is the face of Philippines' third largest telecommunications provider. It rose and broke the duopoly that PLDT and Globe Telecom held for a long time. Other than China's rise, we may also attribute the shift to economic diversification. The reason why the U.S. is no longer the largest investor is because the Philippines wanted to diversify. You see, the U.S. is still a large investor in the Philippines and an important trade partner. Just because they are no longer the largest one doesn't deem them not important. The Philippines had to diversify. They went on to find trading partners and investors from South Korea, Singapore, Japan, and all across its regional neighbors. This diversification strategy has opened up new markets and investment opportunities beyond the U.S. Finally, it is true that the U.S. is no longer as interested as it once was in the Philippines. The U.S.'s role in the 20th century was different from its role now in the 21st century. They have shifted their focus towards addressing global challenges, such as countering terrorism, dealing with climate change, and navigating the complexities of international trade wars. The U.S. has increasingly concentrated on strengthening its alliances with other major economies and geopolitical players, such as those in Europe and the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, we can't also deny the fact that there are more important issues that the U.S. must dive into, which is not just the Philippines. But anyway, do let us know what you think down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.